How's everyone doing? Good? Great? How's everyone's summer going? Nobody's still doing school, right? I know we have a lot of homeschoolers. Nobody's doing like year-round school. Are you? Really? Uh, do you do school year-round? Oh, man. Do you like that or do you? Is, no, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing school year-round too? Wow. So I was homeschooled as well. Um, and uh, thankfully, we never did school year-round. We didn't get a whole lot of holidays off, but, you know, it kind of still worked out. But uh, hopefully everyone's enjoying their summer. You know, we're like maybe five minutes into summer, and I'm already over the heat. I don't know about the rest of you. But you remember when we had that cold snap back in, I think, like April? And it was like, oh, man, I'm ready for summer. But summer's here, and I'm, I'm over it. I'm already over it. Um, Cool. Well, like he said, we're going to be in the book of Jude. Um, and so if you don't have a Bible, we've got a ton of Bibles um, over here to my left, your right. Um, if you want to use your phone, I think that's just fine. You know, I like using my, my Bible app, um, uh, especially when I'm, you know, studying and whatnot. But sometimes it's nice just to have a physical copy in your hands where you can flip the pages. So if you need a Bible, just go uh, feel free to grab one. Um, this, is, this is our last stop before we reach the end of the Emmaus Road. Isn't that kind of crazy? Like, I think we started this series in, at the beginning of 2022. Was it the beginning of 2022? Yeah, so it's been a, a solid two years. Uh, two and a half years is what it's going to end up being. Uh, we've been in this series. Have you all enjoyed it? Those of you who have seen it, you know, who have been around um, long enough, those of you who maybe kind of came along the journey uh, with us, have you all been getting a lot out of it? Yes, no, maybe? Been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. Well, I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, definitely enjoyed studying for it. Definitely enjoyed listening to all the different speakers um, and all of the, uh, the insights um, that they brought. Um, and, and like uh, he said, we're going to be uh, concluding this series uh, next week with uh, Tim Dumas. And so, like you said, Tim's going to answer every question. There's going no, um, to be no gray areas anymore. Everything's going to be answered. And so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be here um, for that. And so uh, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to the book of Jude. We're going to go ahead and just read the whole book because it fits on one page and it's actually really short. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read that for us. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're just going to read, like I said, the entire thing. Uh, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in, uh, in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may peace, uh, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal, cha uh, eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they don't understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like uh, unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned uh, themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with, uh, with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds, swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, uh, on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are grumblers, 
malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must rem remember, beloved, the uh, predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to open your word. I pray that you would use the proclamation of your word uh, to change and transform us into your image. We ask and pray all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. And so this book is referred to as a general epistle. Who can remember what an epistle is? We've looked at plenty of epistles as we've been in the New Testament. Does anyone remember what an epistle is? Uh, kind of. Uh, an epistle is just a letter. It's a letter written to somebody else. And this one is referred to as a general epistle because it doesn't actually have a, a specific person or a specific church it's written to. It's actually just written to Christians um, in general. And the name of this book is derived from its author, right? Jude is the one who wrote it, and so it gets the name um, Jude, especially because it's not being written to somebody. Uh, for instance, like First and Second Timothy were written to Timothy, even though Paul's the one who wrote it. Since this doesn't have a uh, particular recipient, it uh, bears the name of its author. Now, who can tell me anything about Jude? Does anyone know anything about Jude? Wasn't he a brother of Jesus? Was he? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, so there's actually eight different Judes in the New Testament. Did y'all know that? There's about eight different Jews referred to in the New Testament. And so just by the name alone, we actually don't know who this author is. Uh, we, can't say, uh, we can't say exactly which Jude wrote the book. However, in verse 1, he identifies himself as the servant of Christ and brother of James. Now, it's possible that he was just offering all right, the name of his brother even though the people who he was writing to had no idea who his brother was. You know, that'd kind of be like me coming up and saying, hey, my name is Andrew, the brother of Kiana, Kayla, Adam, and Noah. Those names mean nothing to any of you. Y'all don't know any of those people. And so saying those names would kind of, in that context, would seem strange, right? Why would he say that he's the brother of James unless there was a particular James that he had in mind? And in fact, there really is only one James uh, throughout the New Testament that actually has enough prominence to be mentioned by name in this way. And that is James, the brother of Jesus. And so, um, so if that's true, right, if that's the case, that he's mentioning James by name because this is the James that everyone would have known, right, uh, that makes this Jew the half-brother of Jesus. Now, this is pretty cool uh, because uh, Jude did not actually believe in Christ until after his resurrection, I mean, can you imagine growing up with Jesus, right, who's actually God himself? Everyone in here, there's no only children in here, right? Everybody's got a sib at least one sibling. Are you an only child? Yes. Okay, so you may not be able to relate to this, but I grew up with four siblings, and I cannot imagine any of them actually being God incarnate, right? That's just, I mean, e even if you don't have siblings, right, maybe, maybe a cousin or even just a, one of your family members. Can you imagine one of your family members being God? Right? That just seems utterly, like, that just seems crazy. Um, and so, you know, I don't know about you, but I, just based on my personality, um, if I actually lived with God incarnate, I probably would have rejected him too, just because I'd be like, well, you're my brother, and I don't want to believe that, so yeah. I'm not going to. <laughs> right? Um, and so, I, you know, I, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it doesn't seem strange that James, or that, excuse me, that Jude would not believe in Jesus. But um, upon the resurrection of Jesus, right, Jesus is hanged on the cross, he is murdered, um, and three days later he rises from the grave. Um, there was no denying the fact that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. And so Jude comes 
to believe in, um, in Jesus Christ. And he actually ends up becoming a, a prominent figure in his church, which is the reason why he wrote um, this letter. And so he starts the letter, right, just starting in verse 1. Um, you know, he identifies himself, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And he says, may uh, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And so this was a pretty standard greeting uh, that we've actually seen in other letters. Uh, namely, if you go back to 2 John and First and Second Peter, you see a very similar um, sort of greeting where he says, may peace and mercy be multiplied um, to you. And not only that, but this is very much in keeping with other apostolic greetings that we have in other letters, uh, pronouncing blessings upon the reader. And so Jude is praying that those to whom he is writing, he's praying that they would experience God's mercy and peace and love. Um, and then in verses uh, 3 and 4, he says, um, uh, he, he begins to explain why he wrote this letter. He starts by saying that I was very eager uh, to write to you about our common salvation. Now, isn't that interesting? Jude says that he was eager, right? He was excited to write about their common salvation. Having been saved by Christ, having been born again by the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit, Judah is excited to talk about this with his brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is something that you'll actually see uh, happening very commonly, uh, really amongst this church. Um, several people uh, after church, before church, uh, sometimes on Wednesday nights like this, even when we go to each other's houses throughout the week and we spend time with one another, uh, eventually at some point the conversation always ends up coming back to the gospel. It always ends up coming back to something concerning scripture. Because as people who have been saved by Christ, we have, um, uh, there's nothing more exciting for us than to talk about the things that Christ has done for us and the things that God has written for us um, in his word. And so I think that's a very healthy sign um, of, of true saving faith is that you want to talk about these things. If, I, I mean, just, just think about it. If we actually have been saved from our sins, we've actually been raised from our deadness in sin to new life, how could you not talk about that, right? I mean, just think of the greatest thing you can think of, wh wh whatever that is in, in your life. Maybe it's, um, you know, meeting a certain, uh, you know, celebrity type figure, you know, sports, uh, you know, icon, whatever, uh, meeting, uh, you know, being able to go on, you know, this dream vacation, maybe getting to experience, um, you know, I don't know, a certain type of experience like driving a Formula One car. I don't know. Just think of the most amazing thing that happened to you. You would not, it would be so incredible that you could not help but talk about it, right? I mean, some of us have had experiences like that, whether we go and see a movie or um, we go and do this certain thing. And the first thing we want to do is tell people, hey, guess what I got to do? Well, as Christians, the one thing we want to tell other people about, and the, the one thing we especially want to discuss with our brothers and sisters is, guess what God did for me? He raised me to new life. He caused me to be born again. He saved me. And so Jude is very excited to, to write to his brothers and sisters about this very thing. But he very quickly shifts, right, um, at the end of verse 3. And he says, um, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write uh, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So he was excited to joyfully discuss their common salvation, but there was a need that required his attention. He says that certain false teachers who are perverting the gospel, uh, because of these false teachers, he has to write to encourage his fellow believers to contend for the faith. And this is really a charge to every Christian in every age. Because sinners really don't change, right? Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins are looking for a way to avoid the reality of their sin and their need to repent of it. Some will avoid this, um, by rejecting the gospel, right? They'll hear you talk about Jesus and they'll just go, I don't believe any of that stuff. I don't want to hear it, right? Um, other people will turn to other religions, right, to avoid the truth of what the Bible teaches. And some people will avoid the truth of the gospel by perverting it, by reshaping it to their own liking. There's a great quote by Augustine of Hippo, who's a, um, an early church um, father, and he says that if we 
if we take out the stuff in the gospel we don't like and we leave the stuff we do like, it's not the gospel we, we believe, but it's ourselves, right? So if, if we reshape the gospel, right, if we pervert it into something uh, of our own making, it's no longer the gospel of Jesus Christ that we believe, but like I said, it's the gospel of our own making. So we must always be on guard. This is why I say it's a charge to every Christian in every age. We must always be on guard, and we must always be willing to call out false teachers and demonstrate the folly of their false gospels. This requires us to know the scriptures and to be able to apply it in every area. So Jude then, sa- then gives three examples, right? So he says, I'm writing to you because there's this need that requires my attention. Namely, there's these false teachers that have crept into the church. And he gives three examples of sin and judgment from history. Uh, specifically, the examples that he gives are examples of sin against the knowledge of the truth. Apart from Christ, right, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, right? We're, we're not sick. We're not, uh, you know, m- maybe uh, there, there's no signs of life. We're, we're dead, right? And because we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we will ultimately face judgment because of our sins. But there are some people who have some sort of interface with the gospel and with the truth of the gospel, right? Some people grew up in Christian homes where the gospel was rightly uh, taught. Uh, some people made a profession of faith, maybe, and even showed signs of salvation, even began uh, to bear fruit. I think there's a, um, there's a parable in the Gospels that kind of talks about uh, this thing. Uh, but at some point, they eventually just walk away from the faith, right? It seems like they, they believed, and then, and then that changed. Um, and, and even some have had the Gospel preached to them over and over and over again, and so there's no excuse for they're not knowing the truth, right? These examples that Jude gives are, are of people like that, right? People who have heard the truth, uh, maybe even accepted the truth, and yet are abandoning that truth, right? The first example he gives is that of the wilderness generation. If uh, you'll recall, the wilderness generation were those who were delivered from Egypt. Uh, they witnessed all of the plagues upon Egypt, and they experienced the provision of God, right? If you go back and you look at the book of Exodus, as God is bringing these plagues against Egypt, we read that, uh, but in the land of Goshen, right, none of their livestock died. In the land of Goshen, although there was darkness in Egypt, there was still light. Uh, In the land of Goshen, although um, the destroyer came and swept, you know, uh, and destroyed all the firstborn throughout Egypt, in the land of Goshen, they were protected, namely through the provision of the lamb. And so they experienced God's provision, and they saw his mighty acts of salvation in their crossing of the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh. And yet, despite all of this, they were destroyed in the wilderness because of their unbelief. They had experienced the salvation of God, and yet when they saw something that they weren't sure about, they immediately began to to disbelieve that God could actually accomplish what he said he was going to accomplish, right? So God said, I am going to deliver you from Egypt, and he does it. And they saw it, right? And they experienced it. And then God says, I'm going to give you the promised land. They go, I don't know about that. How could you not know about that? You literally saw the sea split in half, and you literally walked across it on dry ground, and you're not sure if God can conquer the people in Canaan? That doesn't make any sense. But that's exactly what they did. They did not believe God, and for their unbelief, they were not permitted to enter into the promised land. The second example that he gives is of angelic beings who rebelled against God. Now, uh, there's some different opinions as to what exactly this, um, what exactly, uh, which event uh, Jude is referring to uh, here in this section. Uh, Is he describing the fall of the angels um, in Satan's rebellion? Or is he referencing those angels who left their proper abode uh, in order to marry the sons of man in Genesis 6? Personally, I take the the view that this is actually a reference to um, Genesis 6. Uh, But it's important to be clear that whichever view you take, um, this is really not a primary issue. And so there's no need to split over differences of opinion on secondary issues. There's certain things in uh, Christian faith that are primary, right? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is not only the Son of God, but he's the only begotten Son of God, eternally existent with the Father as, as the second person of the Trinity. To deny that means you are denying a fundamental tenet of the faith. But when it comes to secondary things, right, um, should we baptize babies or not baptize babies? I mean, that's a pretty important one, but at the end of the day, that's secondary, 
It really is. Uh, and to throw people out of the kingdom or to say you're a heretic because you want to baptize babies is actually to kind of miss the forest for the trees. You, you, you're kind of missing the whole point. That's the secondary issue that doesn't require us to split over that. And so this understanding of what Jude is talking about is also a secondary issue. Where that means that there's room for us to disagree about what exactly he's dealing with. But in addition to that, um, whether, wh whichever view you take of what Jude is referring to, the point that Jude is making is that these angels were judged by God because they rebelled against him, right? These angels are being kept in chains until the great day of judgment. Uh, just like the wilderness generation, right? The wilderness generation witnessed the, the mighty acts of God. These angels, right, um, also at one point followed God. They had privileged positions as his messengers, and yet they eventually abandoned the truth and for their sin. So all of these examples, right, and he's got one more he's going to get to. All of these examples have to do with those who knew God, who had some sort of interface with the truth of God, and yet they abandoned that truth, right? And the last example he gives is that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis 13, we are told that uh, the land of Sodom and Gomorrah was a lush and fertile land. Uh, specifically, it describes this land as a well-watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. Now, when it says like the garden of the Lord, what do you think it's talking about? Which garden of the Lord would he be referring to? Any guesses? The Garden of Eden. The garden of Eden. That's exactly right. So what the author of Genesis is saying is that this land was blessed by God and even experienced an Edenic-like uh, existence. Yet, what do we know about Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed by fire because of their sexual immorality. So even though, right, they had received blessings from God in the, um, in the lush and fertile land, we find out that they did not honor God as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They, they used the blessings of God in the land as a license to engage in sexual immorality. And because of this, they uh, serve as an example of judgment. So he gives these examples, and he goes on, to, Jude goes on to say that these false teachers, uh, like those examples of those who sin against the light of the truth, these false teachers defile the flesh, they reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. He then tells this story about the archangel Michael and an encounter that he had with the devil concerning the body of Moses. And if I'm being completely honest, uh, this, this story kind of escapes me a, a little bit. Um, we know from the book of Daniel, right, that Michael was one of the chief angels and that he was given um, sort of a, a special um, charge to guard the nation of Israel. And we also know from the book of Revelation that Michael is also the leader of Yahweh's armies. Now, what Jude is talk when Jude is talking about this, this disputing over the body of Moses, like I said, I really don't know what he's talking about. Uh, there's nothing in the rest of Scripture that mentions this sort of encounter. Although there is a reference uh, to this event, there's actually a parallel in some apocryphal Jewish literature, uh, namely the Assumption of Moses. But we only have a small fragment uh, of that book, and actually um, Jude's quote is not a direct quote from that book. Um, and so the reason, I, the reason I'm saying this, and, and the reason I'm kind of adding, uh, uh, giving you a lot of information here, is, is just to highlight the fact that we actually don't know the context of this story. And that's okay. Because if God wanted us to have the context, he would have given it to us, right? And so what we need to do, since he did not give us specifically the context of the story, we need to be content that what he has given us is sufficient. Does that make sense? So even though this seems kind of nuts, okay, there's an, argu there's, there's an argument between an angel and the devil about the body of Moses. Just on the surface, that sounds pretty bonkers to me. But God did not give us any more information, and so we have to go, well... If God doesn't give us any more information, then that's the information he wanted us to have. And we need to be okay with that. Um, but at any rate, uh, Jude says that in this encounter, Michael did not pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. And the point that Jude was making is that Michael, as one of God's chief angels, Michael understood the limits of his own authority. And he also recognized the exclusive authority 
of Yahweh and of his son, Jesus Christ, unlike these false teachers who reject Christ's authority. So, in other words, what he's trying to say is that if the archangel Michael recognized the exclusive authority of God, then we should be really suspect of any human being who rejects God's authority, specifically as revealed in Christ and laid out in his word, which is our Bible. So if you ever come up against somebody who says, ah, but we don't need to trust that Bible, you should immediately be suspect of that because even the angels understand the exclusive authority of God. So Jude then explains that these false teachers blaspheme against that which they do not understand. At first, I, uh, when I read this, I thought that was somewhat of an odd phrase. Uh, but here, what he's kind of talking about is the fact um, uh, that, that these false teachers are actually somewhat ignorant of biblical doctrine. Um, I don't know about y'all, but have y'all ever spent time talking to somebody who talked a lot about something they had no idea about? You know, um, it definitely growing up with siblings, you know, I experienced this with my younger siblings. When my younger siblings wanted to be cool, they would start talking about stuff and they really had no idea what they were talking about, but they tried to sound like they knew what they were talking about. You, you, do y'all understand what I'm, what I'm talking about? Well, I don't know if y'all spent any time talking to unbelievers, but whenever unbelievers start talking about God, or talking about spiritual things, or talking about, you know, um, concepts of, of, of sin and, and um, godliness and righteousness. Um, they speak very confidently about things, and actually they have no idea what they're talking about, right? That's kind of what Jude is, is getting at, is that they confidently talk a big deal, and yet they actually don't know what they're talking about. They rely on their own wisdom rather than um, seeking out true wisdom, which is found in God's word. <clears throat> but they not only do this, right? He says they not only blaspheme against that which they don't understand, he says that they are also destroyed by what they know instinctively. Here, Jude is pointing out that these people know the truth because they are made in God's image and they also have his moral law written on their hearts. So by instinct, right, these people get some things right. However, because their morals and actions are not governed by the standard of God's word, but instead they're, they're governed by their own subjective feelings and desires, they ultimately destroy themselves through their sinful compulsions. This is why here at, at this church we stress the centrality of God's word, because it is the objective standard by which our lives, right, our actions, our thoughts, our desires, our opinions, everything is to be ordered by the standard of God's word. We do not discount or dismiss personal experience, but that experience cannot be the primary driving force in our lives. I don't know if you've heard people say things like this, but I've heard plenty of people say, well, I just know this is true, right? Whatever it is they're talking about. I just know this is true because I felt it in my heart. Well, I hate to break it to you, but your heart is not the standard of truth. Whether you feel it or not in your heart does not change the objective truth of the matter, right? If I say, well, I feel in my heart if I jump off this three-story building, I won't break my legs. doesn't matter what you feel about it. You're going to break your legs, maybe even die, right? If I said, well, I just feel in my heart that uh, trees are, you know, purple and the sky is gray. It doesn't matter what you feel in your heart. There's an objective truth. And the feeling in my heart does not change objective truth. The point I'm trying to make is this. If we allow our feelings, right, and our compulsions to be the driving force in our lives, then we'll ultimately be destroyed. And that's the point that Jude is making. So Jude then pronounces uh, a woe upon these false teachers, saying that they walked in the way of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. The sin of Cain is recorded for us in Genesis 4, and it is referenced in Hebrews as well as uh, 1 John. Additionally, this is just some, some interesting tidbits for you. Uh, Jewish tradition actually held Cain as sort of the archetypal sinner. And there's, there's uh, evidence in Jewish, um, I guess, lore, if you want to call it that, that they kind of understood Cain to be the one who instructed other people to sin. So Cain was kind of the first real sinner, and he was the one who kind of instructed others uh, to sin as well. Now, we don't believe that. Okay, we, we, we might, you know, we, we can definitely hold Cain as an archetypal sinner, but we don't believe people who sin have Cain sitting on their shoulder and whispering in their ear, hey, you should jaywalk. Hey, you should steal that bubble gum, you know, whatever, right? We don't, we don't think that's, 
that's happening. But Jude's point is clear, right? These false teachers are not following Christ. These false teachers do not honor God in the same way that Abel honored God. Instead, they're walking in the way of Cain. Jude also mentions um, Balaam, who used his prophetic gift for his own gain. Um, His story uh, can be found in the book of Numbers. Again, Jude Jude is making the point that just like Balaam, right, Balaam used his prophetic gift for his own personal gain. Uh, these false teachers are doing what they do really for their own personal gain. They're not doing what, do, what they do because they love Christ, because they love the gospel, because they want to see his people flourish. They're doing it for their own profit. And then he mentions Korah. Does anyone know the story of Korah? Does, any, does anyone remember this story in the book of Genesis? It's kind of, actually, it's not Genesis, I'm sorry, in the book of Numbers. It's somewhat of an obscure story. But it's a very interesting one. Uh, In Numbers chapter 16, right, we read of Korah leading this rebellion of about 250 men, and they rebelled against Moses' authority. They weren't satisfied with Moses' leadership, and they wanted him removed from that position of leadership. Um, But were these men, were they the ones who put Moses in a position of leadership? They weren't. Who, Who put Moses in a position of leadership? What's that? God did. Yeah, God's the one who put Moses in a position of leadership. So can these men remove Moses from his position of leadership? No, only God can do that. But in verses 31 through 33 of uh, number 16, we read that the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. I don't know about y'all, but that's a pretty like whacked out story right there. Can you imagine witnessing that? The ground just opens up and listen to how it describes it. It says the ground split apart and the earth opened its mouth and it swallowed them. I mean, that's insane, but it happened. And the reason that it happened is because Korah rejected, think about it this way. If God's the one who put Moses in authority, if you're rejecting Moses, who are you actually rejecting? You're actually rejecting God. So the issue wasn't that they didn't like Moses, right? I'm sure Moses had a lot of people who didn't like him. The issue was that they were rebelling against God's authority. And because they rebelled against God's authority, they were judged by God. And the point that Jude is making is that these false teachers, right, Because of their rebellion against Christ's authority and against the authority of his gospel, they too will share in Korah's demise. Uh, Jude then says, uh, let's turn over to uh, verse 12. He then says that these are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Jude here is using uh, descriptive language to illustrate the deceptively dangerous nature of these false teachers and of their false teaching. By hidden reefs, he is making the point that these false teachers uh, and their teaching, it seems safe. But there are things below the surface that can wreak havoc on the life of the Christian and the church. Has anyone here spent any time scuba diving or snorkeling in, in coral reefs? No? Okay, well, it's, it's it, okay. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, right? And it's very, very interesting and very cool to explore. Uh, but coral reefs are extremely dangerous for ships. Um, um, have any of you heard of the Navy, Navy SEALs? Do y'all, ever, just about everybody knows who the Navy SEALs are. Well, they're sort of uh, forefathers, right, were, were what they call underwater demolition teams. Uh, Navy UDT is kind of the, the designation for them. And they were originally um, uh, started to gather data on coral reefs and to blow it up if it would get in the way of amphibious landings. And so The point that I'm trying to illustrate is that on the surface of the water, right, back in World War II, the Allied powers thought, hey, the water's clear. We can just, we can go ahead and we can ride up to shore and we can, you know, conduct whatever operation we're trying to conduct. And their ships kept running into coral reefs. And so they said, we need to find some way to get rid of these coral reefs. And that's where the forefathers of the Navy SEALs came from. And so, like I say, on the surface of the water, right, things may seem calm. 
and things may seem clear. But below the surface, there is real danger. And it's the same thing with these false teachers. They may seem like they're, they're leading good lives, right? On the surface, it may seem like everything's okay. But beneath the surface, right, there's coral reefs. There's hidden reefs. There's real danger that can actually destroy your life. So we need to be on guard against those things. He also says that these are shepherds who are feeding themselves. Now, what are shepherds supposed to do, right? What, what's a shepherd? Someone who protects sheep. Someone who cares for sheep, right? So are shepherds supposed to be feeding themselves? Who are they supposed to be feeding? The sheep. the sheep. But he's saying these shepherds are not feeding the sheep. They're only feeding themselves. They're looking out for themselves. He says that they're waterless clouds. Again, if you're a farmer, right, you kind of rely on the rainfall, right, to grow crops. And so if you see a cloud and it doesn't bring rain, that's, it's almost like, hey, you liar. I thought you were bringing me rain. And then you lied, and now there's no rain. There's water, these are waterless clouds. That's, what, that's, the, that's the image that Jude is trying to bring to your mind. These, these false teachers, they're hypocrites. They're, they, they never can produce what they say or, or what they promise they will produce. He says that they're swept along by the winds. They're not rooted in sound doctrine. They're not built upon the rock, which is Christ. He says they're fruitless trees in autumn. And like trees that fail to produce fruit, the only thing they're good for is to be thrown in the fire. And so Jude says that these false teachers are ultimately, they're barren. They don't produce any fruit and they are ripe. For God's judgment. He says that they're wild waves casting up the foam of their own shame. Has, has anyone spent any like real time in the ocean? You know, whether at the beach or maybe just for fun? Yeah, you know, if, if you can kind of uh, feel the rhythm of the waves, you can kind of figure out how to navigate them. You know, I grew up surfing and if you tried to ride out past the surf, you know, sometimes it can really beat you down. But if you kind of learn the rhythm of the waves, you can figure out how to navigate through those waves so that you can get on the other side of it and ride them in to the shore. Well, he says that these waves are wild, right? They're, it's just chaos. And all they're doing is just sp spraying up foam. It, essentially, what he's saying is that they, they, they don't produce anything. And there's no way to actually um, harness what they're teaching Instead, it's just producing chaos. And all they're really doing is casting up the foam of their own chain. He also calls them wandering stars. Now, this could be a reference to something like a, um, like a shooting star, or it could be a reference to a planet. If you all have spent any time looking at the night sky, you know the planets can move um, in the sky. And, you know, back in the time of ancient Israel, they didn't have GPS, right? They couldn't say, hey, I'm heading to Jerusalem. Will you pull up Apple Maps or Waze or whatever? you know, uh, map app you use. Um, instead, the way they would navigate is by looking at the stars because the stars provided a fixed point to which they could orient themselves and they could figure out, okay, I'm going this direction. All right, I'm, I'm off course. I need to, you know, turn back this direction or turn back that direction. Um, but if you had a star that moved, would you get to where you're wanting to go? No, because the, the point at which you're orienting yourself continues to move. Right? If I said, hey, come to the head of the room and follow me, but I never went to the head of the room, are you ever going to get to the head of the room? No. And so the point that he's trying to make by calling them wandering stars is saying that they're, they're, they're misleading. Right? They're promising to take you somewhere, and they, can't, they don't actually bring you there because they're continually moving about. They're promising to bring you to salvation. They're promising to bring you to God but then they never do because they're actually just wandering stars. And the point that he makes at the end is that the only thing left for them is judgment, or the gloomy darkness, as he put it, puts it. Then in uh, verse 14, uh, Jude quotes directly from the book of Enoch. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right, which is one of the greatest archaeological finds in history, uh, certainly as it pertains to uh, the Bible, uh, we not only found an ancient scroll of Isaiah, right, which predated Christ by 200 years. Now, before this, this archaeological find, there were plenty of people who uh, believed that uh, portions of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 53, they thought it wasn't original. This sounds too much like Jesus, and there's no way this could have been written before Jesus. Somebody had to insert it at a later time. Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found that, no, there's actually a scroll here that predates Christ by 200 years, and it contains Isaiah 53, which just confirms the biblical testimony. But in addition to finding the scroll of Isaiah, they also found plenty of other fragments of plenty of other books uh, 
Also um, included in that was the book of Enoch. Now, Enoch was a character mentioned in Genesis 5. And other than some, some minimal information about his genealogy, um, the scriptures tell us that Enoch walked with God and that he did not die, but that God took him. And other than that, we're really not told anything else uh, about this man. Now, as I mentioned, Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. And by all evidence, um, it appears that the book of Enoch was written during the Second Temple period, uh, meaning that it was written well after Enoch lived, right? Jude calls Enoch the seventh from Adam. And the Second Temple period was after the exile. So we're talking about like thousands of years removed. Um, and so uh, that being the case, um, it still appears that the book of Enoch was actually a very influential uh, book during this period. And it being quoted by Jude here uh, also confirms its influence, influence amongst the Jews of Jesus' day. Now, some people think that because Jude quotes the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch should be included in the Bible. What do y'all think? I mean, he makes a direct quote from the book, so you'd think that, like, the book needs to be included, right? Why not? Because God made it, though. I mean, that's the simplest answer, but that's the correct answer, right? If God wanted this book to be in our Bibles, it would be in our Bibles, and yet it's not in our Bibles. So that's, uh, number one, that's the first and ultimate reason why we don't have it in our Bibles, because God didn't want it that way. I mean, Paul quoted the Greek philosophers. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, does that, does that, does that mean the Song of Zeus needs to be in our Bibles too? Absolutely not. The truth is, is that there's no evidence whatsoever that Jews at any point in history believed that Enoch was part of the scriptures. In fact, there's actually significant evidence to the contrary. For instance, um, one of the practices of the Jews is that they would lay up the scriptures, right? The word of God, they would lay it up in the temple. And the book of Enoch at no point in Jewish history was ever laid up in the temple. So this indicates to us that the Jews at no point saw the book of Enoch as part of scripture. There were plenty of books during um, the second temple period, plenty of books that were influential amongst the Jews, and they did not lay them up in the temple because they knew they were not God's word. And the book of Enoch is included among them. The book of Enoch was never, ever, ever at any point viewed by the Jews or even early Christians. At no point was the book of Enoch ever considered as part of the canon of scripture. And so what's Jude doing by quoting this book? Well, my understanding of this book, the book of Enoch, is that it is an uh, uninspired, fallible, historical record, right, um, that can give us some insight into how people of that time thought. I say it's uninspired, right, because it's not inspired by God, right? We've talked so much about who the author of the book was, but we also talk about who the ultimate author of the book was. And who's the ultimate author of the Bible? God, right? God is the ultimate author of the Bible. The scriptures tell us that men were carried along as they spoke from, married, men were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they spoke from God. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I messed up the, the uh, order of that verse. But God is the one who inspired the scriptures. Enoch is not inspired by God. I say that it's fallible because it can have errors in it, right? Um, just about anything that's written that isn't inspired by God is going to have errors in it. I mean, have y'all, does anyone here use Twitter, right? There's plenty of errors on Twitter, right? You can read any article from any news source and you're going to find errors, right? Because man makes errors. God does not, but man does make errors. And so, like I said, the book of Enoch, it's uninspired, it's fallible, but it does contain some, some historical data, right? Um, this particular quote from Jude actually demonstrates uh, the historical nature of at least this quote, right? Jude says that this was a prophecy of Enoch. And so if the book of Enoch was written thousands of years afterwards, that means that this, uh, this quote must have been passed through oral tradition um, over thousands of years. Um, and so Jude's quotation of it, right, means that it, at least that quote is truthful, right? Even though the book itself the, whole, the entire book of Enoch is uninspired, it's fallible. Uh, this quote is actually inspired, infallible, and inerrant because it's in God's word. Does that make sense? 
I know I'm spending a lot of time talking about the book of Enoch, but I can't tell you how many Christians, right, especially of my generation, have been led astray because they read something like the book of Enoch or because their church never told them. I don't, I don't think you could... I don't think within a 100-mile or even 200-mile radius you'll find another church's youth group that's talking about the book of Enoch. I doubt it. I doubt it. But it's important for you to hear these things from us, right, from your church leaders, from, from men who have studied God's Word, from your pastors. It's important for you to understand these things because people will twist these things to lead you astray. They did it in Jude's day, and they're continuing to do it today. And so, like I said, um, Jude quotes the book of Enoch, and this quote that he gives from Enoch is actually very consistent with other biblical scriptures uh, that speak about God's coming in judgment. And so, again, the book of Enoch as a whole is not given the status of truth. It's certainly not given the status of God's word. All we can say is that this quote in the book of Jude is truth, right? Because it is in God's word. And so, like I said, beyond that, the book of Enoch can give us some insight um, into the mind of the Jew at that time, and it can help us understand the context in which the scriptures were written, but it should in no way, in no way should the book of Enoch ever be viewed as being on par with scripture. It's not. Jude's quote does not imply that first Enoch is divinely inspired or that the book was even written by Enoch himself, right? We know it wasn't. Uh, rather, this book was familiar to his readers and Jude used this quote as a way of confirming his theme of coming divine judgment on the ungodly. So if you want if you want a, a shelf in your mind to sort of categorize the book of Enoch, it's a pop, pop culture reference. That's all it is, right? When uh, Pastor Tim gets up and he talks about the Andy Griffith show, I know that's beyond all of y'all's time, uh, but if I was to get up and talk about what's, what's cool these days, Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars actually is taking a real downward spiral. I don't know if anybody's paying attention to that. It's terrible. Uh, Video games? Which ones? Uh, the Zelda series, the Mega Man series, the Metroid series, the Mario series. Yeah? Okay. So, so if I got up and I made, a, 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 and in my sermon I made a reference to like Mario, for instance, right? Uh, Mario's war against Bowers, Bowser is like our war against sin, right? Something cheesy like that. All I'm doing is using a pop culture reference to make clear what God has said. And that's all that Jude was doing here as well. He's using a pop culture reference in the book of Enoch to make a biblical point. So, um, Jude quotes from the book of Enoch and he says that these teachers, they're ungodly and they're wicked and they're uh, headed for God's judgment. And then Jude reminds them of the apostolic testimony starting in verse 17. He uh, reminds them that there's going to be wolves. That's what the apostles told us. They said as time is coming, there would be wolves in sheep's clothing. There would be false teachers. There would be scoffers. But he reminds them and he exhorts them, do not think that your commitment to the truth is what's causing division in the church. Rather, it is these false teachers who are causing division by leading people astray. Jude then exhorts them to holiness, and these exhortations that he gives are actually um, applicable to believers in every age, like I've said. He tells them, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment that is stained by the flesh. So he says to build yourselves up in the most holy faith. He's telling them, stand firm. Do not be carried away by false doctrines. Continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you will be able to withstand the onslaught of these false teachers. Um, um, the, uh, I don't know if y'all have heard this before, but um, the Secret Service uh, was originally started to uh, help fight against counterfeit money. Did y'all know this? You know, usually in, in our modern day, we associate the Secret Service with protecting the president, but that's not really their primary job. Their primary job is to help uh, fight against uh, money counterfeiting operations. And one of the things that they do in their training, right, to fight against counterfeit money, is they teach them how to identify real money. And by giving them all of this information concerning real money, they're able to spot the fake. So they don't even spend any time really studying counterfeit money. All they do is study the original, the authentic thing. And then when a counterfeit comes in, they can, they can say, oh, something's not right here. I spent a, a few years working in banking, and, you know, obviously our training is not up on the level of the Secret Service. But we do get some training on how to identify counterfeit bills. 
But we don't spend that much time touching counterfeits. In fact, we spent hours, countless amounts of time, studying actual, real, authentic dollar bills. And then once we got familiar with these authentic dollar bills, they gave us a handful of other bills, and immediately we were able to say, oh, this one feels different. That's clearly fake. Oh, this one's missing particular markings. This is fake. Oh, this one has other writings on it that aren't on actual dollar bills. This is fake. My point in, in drawing out this illustration is that if you want to be able to fight against false teachers, against false gospels, against false doctrine, you have to know the real thing. The worst thing you could do is try to spend time studying all these false teachers, right? Study all these Christian cults, study all these false religions. That's the worst way to be able to fight false religions. The best way to be able to fight the false religion is to know the real thing. If you want to fight false doctrine, you have to know true doctrine. If you want to fight against false gospels, you have to know the one true gospel. If you want to fight against false Christ, you actually have to know the real, authentic Christ. And by getting to know the real and authentic Christ, by studying the real, authentic gospel, you'll be able to fight against false doctrine. So he says, build yourself up in the most holy faith. He says, keep yourself in the love of God. It's important to note here that the love of God is defined by his word, not by the whims of unbelieving and unregenerate culture. You know, we live in a time where we talk a lot about love. Everything's about love. Well, we should just love one another. Why can't we just love? Why not just love, 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 love? But this definition of love doesn't come from the Bible, right? It comes from their own making. It comes from fallible, unregenerate mankind. And mankind doesn't get to determine what love is. God's word defines what love is. You hear a lot of people talk about, you know, you have to, you have to speak the truth in love. Right? Love and truth are, you know, are sort of these you know, things that go together. L let, me, let me tell you this. You can speak the truth without love, but there is no way for you to actually truly love if you don't have the truth. We must stand firm on truth, and we must be content to let God's word define what love actually is and not be scared by our culture who's demanding that we uh, cave on biblical doctrine that demands that we compromise when it comes to uh, righteousness and sin, all for the sake of, quote-unquote, love. No, we need to stand firm in the faith, and we need to keep ourselves in the love of God as he has defined it. And he says to have mercy on those who doubt. He says, don't be harsh with those who doubt, but rather in love, guide them to the truth. And lastly, he says to save others by snatching them out of the fire. If your brother or sister in Christ is walking headlong into error, and sin, stop them, right? If you saw somebody walking into traffic when, I don't know, a double-decker bus or a semi-truck was coming by, would you just be like, I just don't want to offend them. I'm just going to, I'm just going to love them from here. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to love them through it. No, you tackle them and get them out of the way, right? That's what he's saying. Snatch them out of the fire. And again, he's not talking about secondary doctrines, right? We can differ on secondary things, right? Uh, he, he's not talking about minimal things. He's talking about primary things. If people are potentially wanting to abandon the faith, whether that's morally or doctrinally, we need to snatch them out of the fire. Pastor Tim has talked about this a lot. You know, he's talked about um, apostasy, which is uh, just sort of a big word that talks about abandoning the faith. And he says there's two, really two types of apostasy. There's doctrinal apostasy and there's moral apostasy. There's people will abandon the faith, by, uh, by denying true doctrine. They'll say, yeah, I know the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God. I know it says he was born of a Virgin Mary. I don't believe it anymore. That's doctrinal apostasy. But there are some people who will say, well, yeah, no, but I know what the Bible says. Yeah, I agree that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, I agree that, um, that you know, he was born of a virgin. But morally, they begin to choose sin over obedience to God, right? If you see people Walking into error, snatch them out of the fire. Stop them. Do not let them do it. And Jude concludes with this benediction in verses uh, 24 and 25. And a benediction is simply a prayer that is a, a blessing prayed over the people. Um, at our church, we have a benediction at the end of our service. And the reason we do this is because we need God's blessing, right? We are now leaving the church service and we're going back into the world. We need God, God's blessing if we're going to endure uh, the sin that we face in the world, if we're going to um, continue to stand uh, on, his on his word. 
Um, as Jude finishes the letter, he recognizes the need for God's blessing if his readers are not only to avoid the false teachers he wrote about, but also if they're to carry out his exhortations to righteousness and holy living. And like I said, we too need God's blessing if we are going to live godly lives in this present age. The reality is that in and of ourselves, we cannot maintain holiness and righteousness. We need God to work mightily on our behalf. And the fact is, is that he has worked mightily on our behalf in the person and work of Christ. Because of what Christ accomplished in his sinless life, his sin-atoning death and his sin-defeating resurrection and ascension, and because of the regenerating and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, we can walk according to his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. Because of what God has done, we can be kept from stumbling and presented blameless before the presence of his glory. And that's the book of Jude, in a nutshell. I don't think I took as long as I thought I would, but I also think I took a look a bit longer than I wanted to. Um, I know that was a lot, and we kind of ran the gambit of, you know, random rabbit trails. You know, the Book of Enoch, talking about the Secret Service and the Navy SEALs. Um, does anyone have any questions real quick before we close about anything we discussed this evening? Well, cool. Let me go ahead and pray for us, and then I think Joe's going to sing one more song. And then uh, we'll go ahead and, and get out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had um, to open your word. God, I pray that um, your word would transform us and change us. God, I pray that the proclamation of your word, uh, if there are students here who don't know you, I pray, Lord, that through your word you would begin uh, to plant those imperishable seeds of the new birth. And I pray that your spirit would begin to work in them and cause them to see the truth of your gospel. We thank you so much for giving us your word, Lord. We thank you so much for giving us a place and a time where we can gather together to discuss your word and to learn from it. I pray that we would be changed by the testimony of your word and by the power of your gospel. We ask and pray all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.